filming location. So we are here looking at El Pastor, which you will not recognise immediately, but don't worry, I am going to help you out, I promise. I'm not just going to point at it and expect it. So where we are in the story is we are in the third Harry Potter, Prisoner of Azkaban, and Harry is very unhappy at the Dursleys, as ever, because that is where we always begin. That is tradition, right? And it gets worse because Aunt Marge turns up. Do you remember her? Yeah. Yeah. 13 at this point, majorly broken the law. So he's really scared. He thinks he's going to Azkaban, and he does the noble thing, and he runs away, basically. <laughs> he gets on the night bus, big purple triple-decker night bus. They do this crazy ride through London, and they pull up just over there in front of Arthur Hooper's, if you guys can see that. Oh, sorry, I just back through my bag. I do apologise. Arthur Hooper's, next to El Pastor, or in the Harry Potter universe, the Leaky Cauldron, which is what we are here to talk about right now. So I'll pass this around so you can see it properly, so don't worry if you don't see it like in the first place. But you can see this big fake front just here. This was all fake. They put this right on top of that silver thing, basically, if you picture it all the way over the top. Now, can anyone guess what the problem mm. might have been when they got here? It's a very niche, weird Harry Potter thing. Does anyone here know what a hand of glory is? Yes. Yes, tell me what a hand of glory is. It's when Harry is doing flu powder for the first time uh, at the Weasley's house and he sets into the fireplace and instead of saying Diagon Alley like a real person, he goes Diagon Alley and he ends up at Nocturne Alley, the sort of dark Diagon Alley. Ends up in Bogan and Burke's, the dark magic shop. And this is where we find out that Harry is not the sharpest knife in, the, in a drawer because he sees a severed hand stood up like this. What do you do when you see a severed hand in a dark magic shop? He touches it and it grabs him. It's sort of like there's a bit of a like tussle between them. It's a moment in the film that makes you jump. And Draco Malfoy actually ends up buying that hand and he uses it later on in the books, as you say, in the Half Blood Prince to let the Death Eaters into the castle. You can go back to Harry Potter. So, if we see first the Green Bridge, which is Lambeth Bridge, and then after that we see that bridge that looks like it should be on a spaceship. There's lots of people walking across it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's the bridge. bridge, exactly. Right. Right. So that bridge is a very Harry Potter important yeah. bridge, as we can as we can all tell. Uh, well, a lot of us can tell. We're all we're all witness. Yeah, as you know, you yeah. But anyway, so we're going to talk first about the bridge, then about the Harry Potter significance of the bridge. It's a story that just makes more sense that way, basically. So, uh, anyone know what that bridge is called in real life? Yeah. Yeah. The Millennium Bridge. Excellent. So, in real life, that bridge is known as the Millennium Bridge. Now, if we go back to Harry Potter, uh, in the Half Blood Prince, in the book, we start off and we have that scene in the Prime Minister's office, the Muggle Prime Minister where he gets a letter that the Brockdale Bridge has been knocked down by a storm. And then Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic, comes down the chimney and says it was not a storm, it was in fact the Death Eaters. It was all the more supporters that knocked the bridge down. I mean, we're quite a big group today, uh, so have a look. Now you can see it's quite a cool visual choice, it kind of unravels and looks pretty interesting, so it was Now we have two, as you recall. Our second Harry Potter site is if you look up there at that dome, looking quite lovely in the sunshine. Everyone see that? Yeah? Anyone know what that is? <laughs> but before that, can anyone guess where this might have inspired Harry Potter life? Any ideas? From Durmstrang, yes, the Durmstrang ship, exactly. So in the fourth one we have the Triwizard Tournament, we have the two foreign exchange schools that come over, we have Bo Battens in the winged horse carriage that sort of swoops gracefully onto the lawn, and then we also have Durmstrang, exactly, we have Durmstrang, who come over in a pirate ship, much like this one, and they come up from under the lake as though it's a submarine. So this was J.K. Rowling's inspiration for that pirate ship. Now it's a very simple inspiration, this one. J.K. Rowling really liked the ship, and she liked the story of Sir Francis Drake, and for the whole time she'd been writing Harry Potter, <coughs> she wanted to put in a tribute to that story, because she thought it was very cool and very interesting. So genuinely, this is why the Durmstrang ship is in Harry Potter. Okay. The original one was owned by a guy called Sir Francis Drake. Now, Sir Francis Drake was a famous privateer. Does anyone know what that means? Any idea? Yeah, pirate, basically. A pirate is a privateer, but a special kind of pirate, not just any pirate. Now, uh, the other thing about Sir Francis Drake uh, that's quite interesting is that he actually believed in magic. Like, full on, properly, properly believed in it. He would go down to Devon at the bottom of the country, which supposedly back then was known as Witch's Country. That was supposed to be where all the witches were. He would go down there and he would get real witches, you know, real ones, to do protective spells for him and enchantments and that sort of thing. So uh, because he wanted to live forever, Sir Francis Drake actually went on quest looking for, and actually believed in, the Philosopher's Stone. Genuinely. It was Mr. Weasley and Harry Potter in the fifth one. So, if we remember, at the start of the fifth one, 
We have that scene where Harry and Dudley get attacked by a few Dementors. Do you remember that happening? And uh, Harry has to think quite quickly, he gets his wand out and he goes Expecto Patronum and he gets rid of the Dementors, they fly away and then he realises that he has again broken Wizarding Law, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah again, it's his favourite thing to do, it really is, he loves breaking the law. Where Mr Weasley doesn't <laughs> understand how an oyster card works, do you remember that happening? Where he's like, oh, I'm amazing with you. Like, oh, it's like, no, that's just over there. So uh, if we see the big tube gate on the right, and then we count three tube gates inwards, that is the tube barrow where Mr Weasley got stuck. Uh, a very iconic Harry Potter moment, I think we can do three. We have our first Harry Potter cameo, it's still in the fifth one, however slightly back in time. So when Harry gets his letter to go to the hearing with Mr Weasley, uh, if we recall the auras from number 12 Grimmauld Place come and get him, the band of good wizards, Grimmauld yeah, 5 yeah. Voldemort, yeah, yeah, they come and they get him. They take him on this big crazy broomstick ride down the Thames and they take him to 12 Grimmauld Place. Now this crazy broomstick ride is on this stretch of the Thames where we're standing right now, basically. So. It starts over there, I'll pass this around again in a minute. Now, just for the record, I'm going to talk about another cameo in a minute. The first one I talk about is the top three pictures, and the second one I talk about is the bottom one. So I'll pass it around in a second just so you know what you're looking at. Okay. Uh, so, the crazy broomstick ride starts off by Hungerford Bridge, which is that white one, which is down there. And then they fly past the London Eye, they fly past uh, the Aquarium and the London Dungeon and all that stuff. They fly under Westminster Bridge, they fly along the Thames some more, and they actually fly under Westminster Bridge again. Because there is a great big raging continuity error in that film, genuinely. We also have another little cameo. So if you remember when we were talking about the night bus, yeah, yeah. Yes. there's that bit where the night bus squeezes between two other double-decker buses. Do you remember that happening? Yeah. Now that is up there on Westminster Bridge, funnily enough, just where that bus is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, that bus is just where the night bus was. Now, how they did it was the night bus did actually go over Westminster Bridge, as did those two double-decker buses, but not at the same time. They did some quite fancy CGI splicing, as far as I understand it. They basically got all the shots of the buses in the places that they need them, and then had a play with some very clever technical people and made it look like the bus was on between, pretty much. But they were never there at the same time. everybody to our next stop. Welcome to Trafalgar Square. What we are here to look at, we're not going to go in because there's a big event going on right now, so we'll get lost. We have a lot of stuff going on. Another thing that happens in Trafalgar Square is film premieres, which is what we are here to talk about. So, the wow. final film premiere of the final Harry Potter film happened in Trafalgar Square, and the reason we bothered to talk about it is because it was an absolute circus. It really, really was. It was insane. So you see this screen just here? Yeah. That was up there on the columns at the National Gallery. So you can picture how wow. big it actually was. Also this red carpet went all the way through the square, all the way around the back of that big building just there, which is the Canadian Embassy, and round up that way to Leicester Square Odeon, which is where the film was actually shown. It was shown at Leicester Square. Now I'll pass this around. Now that red carpet actually broke the world record for the longest ever red carpet at a film premiere. Wow. Genuinely. Now just for some context as to how long it actually was, if you take that route to Leicester Square, uh, it's about a 15 minute walk. That's how wow. big the red carpet actually was. Uh, it's since been broken again by a, by a premiere in Shanghai, but it was the longest for a very long time. So welcome to our next stop. Can anyone guess where we are? Nocturne Alley. Yes, we are in Nocturne Alley. So welcome to Nocturne Alley. Now this is technically an inspiration location, but it's a bit of a weird one. So I, I'll tell you about it. So basically, what happened was when they were first filming Nocturne Alley in the second one, obviously, the location scouts went to J.K. Rowling and they said, "Any ideas where we could film? Like, do you have anything that inspired you? Any particular streets?" And she brought them here. And she literally said, welcome to Nocturne Alley. This is the place for me. This is what I was writing about when I wrote the book. This is this street is Nocturne Alley for me. And then they measured it, and they actually discovered that it was too small to fit in Harry Potter's notoriously big filming group. It was actually too narrow. So what they did instead was they actually copied it as a, as a set at Warner Brothers. They made a literal 
copy of this string. So again, I'll flash it around and then pass it properly. Wow. Welcome to our last stop. Welcome to Diagon Alley, everybody. This is where we are right now. So this is J.K. Rowling's personal inspiration for Diagon Alley. So um, this is J.K. Rowling's favourite street in London, and she has confirmed that it was the street that inspired her to write about Diagon Alley for a number of reasons. The first and most obvious reason probably being if you see Watkins Books just there, can everybody see that? That's yes. on the right. So Watkins Books is London's oldest and biggest esoteric bookshop, which basically means a magic bookshop, genuinely. Uh, so you can go in there, you can brush up on your transfiguration or your ancient runes, you can get your palm read, your tarot cards done, there are potions, crystals, you name it, it is at Watkins. So uh, basically, even if you don't believe in that stuff, still a very, very interesting shop to look in, just like as a sort of tourist to walk around, like it's, it's very, very interesting. So a literal magic shop on Diagon Alley, you can see where she was getting her stuff from. Uh, also, what, you, what the rest of these shops pretty much are is very strange little antique shops and knick-knack shops where you never quite know what you're going to find. So again, like, you can see the vibe she was going off. You can see why this inspired her to write about Diagon Alley. Uh, you can also see they used it as a slight visual inspiration. So if you see the hanging signs and the shop fronts, they didn't copy it like they did with Nocturne, but they used, like, slight visual cues. You can see where they were getting stuff from. Uh, we also have, if you look three shops down on the left, we have Colin Narbuth and Son. Now Colin Narbuth and Son actually sells magical money, genuinely, it actually sells Gringotts money. So there is some in the window right now. However, before that, it has always done gold coins the size of hubcaps, as galleons are described in the books. So again, you can see where she was cherry picking various stuff, using stuff from various bits down this street. Uh, we also have down here a lot of old dusty hardback bookshops full of old dusty hardback books. Uh, however, for the end of the tour, if we recall in the books, Di uh, the Leaky Cauldron is said to be at the end of Diagon Alley off Charing Cross Road, right? Now that just over there is Charing Cross Road, and the Leaky Cauldron in the books is said to be disguised to muggle eyes as a Pergamon. <laughs> so welcome to the Leaky Cauldron, we cannot see it because we are muggled and it is enchanted. But this is where I leave you, at the spiritual home of the Leaky Cauldron, with a cheap joke. Because it's <laughs> story, let's be honest. Uh, other than that, if you've had a nice time, please leave us a review on TripAdvisor. Uh, we rely on that for advertising, so we super appreciate it. Also, mention my name, I get house points. You don't pretend that doesn't happen, because it does. Uh, but other than that, have a wonderful day, and you are all free elves. I'll Thank stick you. about for a minute or two in case anyone has any questions about directions. But uh, yeah, have a good day. Thank you for watching this vlog and if you like this vlog remember to give a big thumbs up and to subscribe and of course to comment below about my experience here and what you think about it and yeah well let's end this video by saying remember to stop existing start living and be alive bye